In the quaint town of Esto, Florida, resided Adriana Hudo, a spirited seven-year-old girl, alongside her mother, Amanda, and her lively six-year-old half-brother, AJ. Adriana's days were filled with boundless energy and ceaseless movement, characteristic of her diagnosis of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. This neurodevelopmental condition, typically detected in childhood and often persisting into adulthood, posed challenges for Adriana, manifesting in difficulties with attention, impulse control, and hyperactivity. Amanda, in an interview, candidly shared the complexities of parenting Adriana, recounting the constant struggle to bond and interact with her dynamic daughter. Adriana's perpetual motion and propensity for mischief occasionally led to more serious incidents, such as a week-long stay in a behavioral center. In their cozy home in Esto, Florida, Adriana's brother, AJ, was the calm. He enjoyed playing quietly by himself, a peaceful contrast to Adriana's boundless energy. When Adriana was just a baby, their mom, Amanda, had to leave for National Guard duty, leaving Adriana with family for a while. This separation made it tough for Amanda and Adriana to connect at first, but their bond grew stronger over time. Amanda noticed she sometimes had a shorter temper with Adriana than with AJ. One night, after finishing a late shift as a nursing assistant on August 8, 2007, Amanda came home exhausted and decided to rest before the next busy day. Her two young children, Adriana and AJ, were engrossed in cartoons. Amanda dozed off on the couch, only to wake up around noon to the kids eagerly asking to play outside before they went shopping for school supplies. Reminding them they couldn't swim before the errand, Amanda headed for a quick shower. Upon peeking out the window, she spotted AJ up a tree, but Adriana was nowhere to be seen, though Amanda wasn't too worried at the moment. Beyond the sliding glass door, the backyard awaited, complete with its four-foot above-ground pool, a source of both joy and caution in Amanda's mind. Knowing the potential risks associated with unsupervised pool play, Amanda had always emphasized the importance of staying away from the pool without her watchful eye. To further reinforce this rule, she diligently kept the pool ladder locked away in the shed, a precautionary measure to deter any impromptu swimming sessions. Amanda, preoccupied with household chores, noticed AJ climbing trees beside the house. When she asked about Adriana, AJ mentioned she was by the pool, assuming she was just playing. Amanda told AJ to fetch her inside. Stepping outside to investigate, she was met with a heart-stopping scene. AJ, frantically struggling by the pool, attempting to retrieve his sister from the water's grasp. With a surge of terror, Amanda raced to their side, her heart pounding in her chest as she beheld Adriana's limp form, her once vibrant complexion now tinged with alarming shades of purple and blue. Instinct kicking into overdrive, Amanda wasted no time. With trembling hands and a racing mind, she began the harrowing task of administering CPR to her daughter, her every movement fueled by sheer desperation. As adrenaline surged through her veins, Amanda's trembling fingers fumbled for her phone, fingers dancing over the keypad as she dialed 911. Her voice strained with urgency as she pleaded for immediate medical assistance. I need an ambulance. What's wrong, ma'am? My daughter fell in the pool and she's not breathing. And she's not breathing? How old is she? She's seven years old. All right, hang on just a second, ma'am. Oh, God. Her lips are purple. What do I do? Water's just coming out of her nose. Please hurry. With sirens wailing in the distance, the emergency response team swiftly descended upon the scene, their arrival a beacon of hope in the face of tragedy. As the first responder, Fire Chief Charles Corcoran rushed to Amanda Lewis's home to find her kneeling over her daughter, Adriana, performing CPR. Despite his efforts, Adriana showed no signs of life, her body still warm, but pulseless. Though briefly revived, Adriana's heartbeat slipped away, and she was airlifted to Bay Medical Center, where doctors fought valiantly, but ultimately declared her dead at 5.05 p.m. The scene painted a tragic picture, a toy wagon snug against the pool and a child's bicycle nearby. Investigators speculated that Adriana had climbed the pool wall using the wagon, met with an accidental fall, possibly striking her head on the wagon or bicycle before drowning. As EMS rushed Adriana to the hospital, they expected Amanda to be in a state of shock and distress, a natural reaction for any mother facing such a traumatic event. However, hospital staff observed a different side of Amanda. When Dr. Fox, one of the attending physicians, approached her in the waiting room to discuss Adriana's condition, Amanda's focus seemed oddly fixated on vending machines rather than her daughter's well-being. Witnesses in the waiting room couldn't help but notice Amanda's detached demeanor. When Dr. Fox returned with the devastating news of Adriana's passing, 
Amanda's reaction remained eerily devoid of emotion. No emotion. You tell a mother that her seven-year-old daughter died and you expect um, some reaction. Later, when Amanda entered Adriana's room, she displayed a brief moment of tenderness, gently running her hand through her daughter's hair and planting a kiss on her forehead before quietly exiting. In a candid interview with ABC News, Amanda revealed the depths of her shock upon learning of her daughter's tragic demise. Recounting the heartbreaking moments that followed, Amanda described tenderly brushing Adriana's hair, pressing kisses to her brow, and enveloping her in one final embrace, knowing deep down that it would be their last. Fire Chief Charles Corcoran was the first to respond. When you arrived on scene, what did you see? It looked like a accident with the mother kneeling and sobbing and crying. She exhibited all these signs of shock. Adriana was still warm. She was wet. I knelt down and I began CPR. And what were you thinking? Let it be successful. I actually thought I had a heartbeat. And you thought maybe there was a chance? Yes, I thought there was a chance. Adriana is airlifted to the nearest hospital. In the ER, Dr. Linda Fox is waiting for the nearly lifeless little girl. Barely three hours after Adriana's tragic passing, the police arrived at the hospital to interview Amanda Lewis. The interrogation commenced at 7.39 p.m., with detectives eager to untangle the events of that fateful day. Amanda opened up about Adriana's struggle with ADHD, explaining how her attention flitted between activities, including a desire to swim, and the need for school shopping. Can you tell me about what all happened today? Can um, you take us through that? Yes. Well, I got home from work. I work 11 to 7. Um, they were watching cartoons. Um, I told them if they'd let me take a little nap, that we'd get up and get ready and go do their school shopping. Um, they were good. I took my nap. I got up probably around 12, 12.30, 1 o'clock, somewhere around in there. Um, they wanted to go outside, so I let them go out. Um, they were out there playing, they, you know, come in and out. Um, around close to the incident, they had went outside. They were playing in the front yard, in the driveway with some of AJ's trucks. And I went out, checked on them, and I told them I was supposed to take a shower. And then they could come in, we'd get them bathed, and then we'd go do their school shopping. Around an hour after waking up, showering, and attending to some laundry, AJ appeared at the front door informing Amanda that Adriana wanted to clear bugs from the pool for a swim. The above-ground pool, an Intex brand sand and surf easy set model, spanned 18 feet wide and 4 feet deep, with a water level measuring between 32 to 35 inches. A white bucket discovered in the pool hinted at Adriana's possible attempt to fish out insects before her tragic accident. Amanda's boyfriend and other witnesses later confirmed that despite her fear, Adriana had swum in the pool before, always under adult supervision. Returning to the pool site, investigators meticulously scrutinized every detail. Child-sized shoe prints inside a red wagon, wedged against the pool, suggested playful activity. Mud inside the wagon, imprinted by little shoes, indicated recent use. The significant overflow of water from the pool highlighted the urgency of the recovery effort following Adriana's fall. Piecing together the evidence, investigators surmised that Adriana had ingeniously devised a plan to rid the pool of pesky bugs utilizing the wagon and pans to reach inside. Tragically, in her innocent attempt, Adriana reached too far, losing her footing and suffering a fatal blow to her head in the ensuing fall. While the scenario appeared to offer a straightforward explanation, with Adriana's hyperactivity adding a layer of plausibility, some began to question whether the incident was truly as simple as it seemed. Was it merely a tragic accident, as everyone believed? Or were there deeper complexities at play, waiting to be unearthed? As Adriana fought for her life in the confines of the hospital, her younger brother AJ sought solace with their grandparents. His young mind told another narrative so unsettling it sent shivers down their spines. I threw her in the pool. My mama, mama threw him in the pool. My sister, AJ, threw And then what happened when she threw her in the pool? She started holding her face. Troubled by the gravity of AJ's account, his grandparents felt compelled to act, guiding him to the local police station to share his harrowing tale. Inside the solemn walls of the police station, AJ's small frame trembled as he recounted the chilling events that unfolded in their family home. Mama, don't this What does that mean? Drowning. According to the young boy's testimony, 
their mother's anger boiled over when Adriana accidentally sprayed window cleaner across the TV screen. Fueled by rage, AJ claimed, their mother subjected Adriana to a horrifying punishment, forcibly dunking her into the pool as a cruel form of retribution. In AJ's eyes, this act of discipline spiraled into tragedy, ultimately leading to Adriana's untimely demise. With a mixture of disbelief and horror, those gathered in the interrogation room listened as AJ vividly demonstrated how he had seen his own mother drowning his beloved sister in the pool. AJ's interview on the afternoon of August 8, 2007, only four hours after the incident, documented a chilling reenactment. Investigators faced the daunting task of discerning whether AJ's account was factual or simply the product of a young boy's imagination. As AJ underwent two rounds of interviews with investigators and a child expert on that fateful day, his testimony steadfastly held to a singular narrative. Their mother had subjected Adriana to a cruel punishment by dunking her in the pool. So she read me and sprayed something that made everything smell good. And she sprayed it However, as the sessions unfolded, subtle inconsistencies began to emerge, casting doubt on the reliability of AJ's account. In one iteration of his story, AJ detailed a sequence of events where their mother had purportedly sent Adriana to the park before trailing her and inflicting the alleged punishment. Yet, in a puzzling twist, AJ later contradicted himself, admitting to having no direct witness to the incident. When confronted with AJ's fluctuating testimony, Amanda swiftly dismissed his claims as nothing more than the product of an overactive imagination. Good. I talked to you about trying to explain the bruises, and uh, we can't come up with a reasonable explanation as to why they're there. I mean, I don't know why they're there. I mean, the only thing I can think of is either she hit the tablet container, or either she went completely to the bottom of her head, or she hit it on the wagon before she went in the pool. That's the only explanations I have. Okay. However, skepticism lingered among both investigators and the public alike. While it's true that children are prone to weaving elaborate tales, the gravity of AJ's allegations begged the question, what motive could he possibly have for fabricating such a distressing story? As the investigation unfolded, AJ's core claim about his mother dunking Adriana remained consistent, despite some embellishments. What do you mean when you say dunk? Somebody dunk somebody. Mama dunk my sister. What does that mean? How that happens? When Adrian messes with stuff today. So. Who was in the pool? Adrian. Did your mama get in the pool? No. Adrian was just in the pool with mama. But Adrian was playing like this, and mama holding him like this, so she went scream. Adrian started screaming when she mama took her hand off of Adrian's. Uh, face. Where were they at? At the pool. However, when Amanda underwent a polygraph test, the results surprisingly indicated her truthfulness. With conflicting evidence piling up, the question of who to believe became increasingly murky. Yet, as detectives delved deeper into the family's dynamics, a troubling portrait emerged. Witnesses painted a starkly different picture of Amanda than the devoted mother she presented herself as. Instead, accounts surfaced of neglect, with the children sometimes left hungry and alone. Did Adriana watch it with you? She only watched it in the morning. This morning? So she got up out of her bed and came in the living room? Did she go? What did y'all have for breakfast? I didn't have breakfast. Did y'all have any lunch? Uh, nothing. What did Adriana have? Nothing. She, she, didn't, didn't, she didn't have no breakfast either? Yes, sir. She, hadn't have, she didn't have no lunch either? A subsequent inspection of the family home only served to corroborate these claims, revealing a squalid environment permeated by the stench of urine. As the interview continued, detectives honed in on a crucial question. Did Amanda perform CPR on Adriana after finding her lifeless in the pool? Investigators found it odd that despite Adriana's recent death, Amanda displayed no signs of distress during the interrogation. Chief Corcoran, the first responder, later confirmed that upon his arrival, Amanda wasn't actively attempting to revive her daughter. 
She was simply kneeling beside her. The officer's astonishment grew as they surveyed the house, noting the conspicuous absence of any toys despite the presence of two young children. Amanda's boyfriend and other witnesses later confirmed that, despite her fear, Adriana had swum in the pool before, but always with an adult present. Back at the pool site, investigators meticulously combed through every detail. Child shoe prints found inside a red wagon, wedged against the pool, meant someone was playing. There was mud inside the wagon, imprinted by little shoes. A significant overflow of water from the pool meant the recovery effort after Adriana fell in also checked out. The investigators also noted a stark absence of children's toys at the home. Prosecutor Larry Basford was immediately disturbed by the crime scene photos. When you looked in AJ and Adriana's room, it was, it was just barren. And then I got to looking, and everywhere I looked, I didn't see what I was looking for. Aside from the wagon, AJ's toy gun, and the bicycle near the pool, there wasn't much else around. Inside Adriana and AJ's bedroom, a bare bunk bed with mattresses, but no sheets or blankets greeted the eye, accompanied by a lingering smell of urine. Perplexed by this discovery, they queried Amanda, who offered a perplexing explanation. She claimed to have confiscated the toys as a disciplinary measure, relegating them to the shed. However, a meticulous search of the shed failed to yield any trace of the missing playthings, deepening the mystery surrounding their disappearance. As investigators delved further into Amanda's life, they uncovered unsettling revelations about her relationship with Adriana. Reports surfaced of Amanda frequently berating Adriana for bedwetting, shedding light on a fraught dynamic within the household. Adding to the mounting concern, Amanda's co-workers at the nursing home divulged a chilling incident that occurred three months prior to the tragic drowning. Allegedly, Amanda had openly expressed thoughts of harming her daughter after Adriana defaced her car with permanent marker, etching the word loser into the interior. These disturbing details painted a troubling portrait of Amanda, raising unsettling questions about her role in Adriana's untimely demise and casting doubt on the innocence she professed. As the investigation pressed on, the search for truth intensified, with each revelation bringing the dark undercurrents of the case into sharper focus. Amidst the unfolding investigation, a chilling revelation surfaced. Amanda had previously experienced the tragedy of losing another child under mysterious circumstances. Recounting the harrowing event from her teenage years, Amanda described the gut-wrenching discovery of finding her toddler unresponsive on the floor. Although authorities at the time attributed the child's death to a sudden seizure, the eerie parallels between this past incident and Adriana's untimely demise raised troubling questions, casting doubt on the innocence surrounding both tragedies. Merely a month following the heart-wrenching incident, Amanda's world was shattered once again as she found herself handcuffed and facing charges of first-degree homicide. Presented with a plea deal that dangled the promise of a lighter sentence, Amanda's refusal to accept it sent shockwaves through the courtroom. As the trial commenced in February 2008, all attention turned to AJ, thrust into the spotlight as the prosecution's key witness despite the defense's attempts to undermine his credibility due to his shifting statements. The courtroom held its breath as AJ, initially unaware of his mother's presence, calmly answered questions from the prosecutor. However, when confronted with the reality of his mother's proximity, AJ's facade crumbled, tears streaming down his cheeks in a heartbreaking display of emotion. Your mother was in the courtroom here today. Would that be the truth? No, sir. That would not be the truth. Why is that? Because she's not in the courtroom? Where is your mother? Jail. She's in jail. That woman sitting right there between them. Have you ever seen her before? Yes, sir. Who is that? My mother. Now you recognize your mother? Yes, sir. Hey, James. Hey, Judge. Yes, sir. All right. Here. In a poignant moment, the prosecution presented AJ with drawings he had created earlier, depicting the traumatic events he had witnessed. While AJ managed to recount the main details of the tragedy, he occasionally veered off course, his young mind struggling to make sense of the traumatic memories. Who is this? What is this? My mama. And what is she doing? She's with my sister. How is she doing that, AJ? Put her hand on her face. At one point, 
He even mentioned Adriana fishing bugs from the pool, a detail that seemed out of place. Given the passage of time since the incident and AJ's tender age at the time, it's understandable that certain aspects of the ordeal may have become blurred or suppressed in his memory. As the prosecution built its case against Amanda, they called upon a multitude of witnesses to paint a vivid picture of the events leading to Adriana's tragic demise. Family members testified to Adriana's deep-seated fear of water, asserting that she would never willingly venture into the pool alone, reinforcing the implausibility of her accidentally drowning. Adding further weight to the prosecution's argument, Amanda's co-workers stepped forward to share chilling anecdotes of her disturbing remarks regarding Adriana. The barrier rate, and we said, what's wrong, Amanda? She said, I'm just going to kill him and kill her. And I was like, don't say that. She was just like at the end of her rope that morning. These accounts painted a troubling portrait of Amanda's mindset leading up to the tragedy. Yet, it was the discovery of bruises on Adriana's delicate face that sent shockwaves through the courtroom, leaving an indelible mark on the proceedings. Resembling handprints, these telltale marks starkly corroborated AJ's heartbreaking testimony of his mother's relentless and merciless actions, as he described her holding Adriana's face beneath the water's surface. With each witness testimony and piece of evidence presented, the case against Amanda grew increasingly compelling. In a gripping courtroom showdown, the prosecution argued that Adriana's drowning wasn't a mere accident, but a punishment that had gone tragically awry. Highlighting the discrepancy between the size of the pool, measuring only 32 by 35 inches deep, and Adriana's height of 47 inches, they contended that had it been an unintentional fall, Adriana could have easily stood up. This compelling argument left a haunting echo in the minds of jurors. As the trial unfolded over four intense days, the jury listened intently to witness testimonies and examined the evidence presented. With the weight of Adriana's fate hanging in the balance, they deliberated for a mere two hours before rendering their verdict. Guilty, the courtroom erupted with emotion as Amanda was sentenced to spend the rest of her days behind bars without parole. Despite maintaining her innocence, Amanda's appeal in 2010 proved unsuccessful, and she remains incarcerated at the Lowell Correctional Institution. Since that fateful day in court, she hasn't seen her son, AJ. He was adopted by the same caring family who had taken him in when Amanda was arrested, providing him with a loving and supportive home environment. Thanks for joining us for this episode. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to stay in the loop for our future releases. And if you found this video captivating, you're in for a treat with the one currently displayed on your screen. Click to watch, and we'll continue the investigation in the next episode.